So we're actually be going to be offering a series of webinars. I will be over the next year um, that range in topic from today's, which is very fundamental to at the end being very application and case history oriented. The focus will be on the hydraulic aspects uh, using GCLs as hydraulic barriers and their hydraulic behavior. And what really gave birth to this is over the last uh, couple of decades, we've really seen an evolution of GCL uh, applications and uh, in GCL products. Uh, early on, uh, I, I think the earliest GCLs were in, uh, used in the late 1980s. Uh, Bill Schubert, who was with Waste Management at the time, Bill retired a couple years ago, was one of the you know, inspirational people, had a vision about a, how a different product could be used in containment systems and was, I think, the first person to use uh, GCLs in containment systems, at least in North America. Uh, and that experience was largely driven around municipal solid waste and was a very favorable experience over the years. Uh, and then as the, the utility of GCLs became more common, or the frequency with which they were used, the a complexity of the situations and particularly that the liquids they needed to contain became more significant. And over the last 10 years or so, last decade roughly, uh, we've really experienced a much broader range of both liquids that we need to contain and GCL products uh, that are available to the engineer and the owner to be able to use in their facilities. So one example that many people may be familiar with if you're from uh, North America is the uh, widespread use of GCLs in coal combustion product disposal facilities. The range of leachate chemistries in uh, coal ash disposal facilities is very broad. Uh, anywhere from something that might look like a, a municipal solid waste leachate, which we have a lot of experience it, with, to something that may look like a very high ionic, high ionic strength brine, which we don't have as much experience with. And so there's been a breadth of different liquids we need to manage and a breadth of different products that have been developed throughout the industry by all the different manufacturers uh, to be able to manage those liquids for different applications. And, and as that breadth of applications and products uh, became uh, broader and broader, uh, it became apparent to a number of us that it was important to begin to have a discussion about kind of the, the basic ideas behind GCLs. Where do they work? Where does a conventional GCL work well? Where, what are its limits? When do we need to look at other types of GCL products? What do we know about installing these different products in actual case histories? What do we know about testing them, validating them, and to bring that information together in a series of webinars, largely intended to provide practicing engineers and owners and regulators with the information they need to be able to, one, uh, select the appropriate products for the applications that they have in mind, and two, to be able to install them with confidence and uh, have a high degree of confidence that their uh, function will be as they expected. So that's the broader uh, uh, concept behind this series of webinars. I, I think many of you may know me. My name is Craig Benson of Dean of Engineering at the University of Virginia. I'm a geotechnical and geological engineer by trade. I've worked in the industry for more than 30 years, and I've been working on GCL-specific issues as part of my practice for 25 years right now. And I actually started off my career as a clay liner person, a compacted clay liner person. I, In the 1980s and early 90s, that was my bread and butter. And in fact, to think of a GCL as a replacement for a compacted clay liner was almost heresy back, back then. Uh, and today we look at compacted clay liners as really the kind of alternative to a GCL, that the GCL really is the product of choice. And um, so my profession has grown uh, in this area over the last few decades. And I'm largely going to share with you today some of the principles that have come out of that, what we've learned over those decades and how we can use them in practice. So this is the first topic. And I'm going to get my get my slides to move. Oh. Ah, there we go. I had a little hard time getting them to move. But we are going to have uh, uh, four webinars. And before I begin, I 
uh, in, in more detail. I should just mention one more thing. Uh, I want to think, uh, uh, thank Jimmy Youngblood of Solmax. I've known Jimmy for a long, long time, uh, most of my career. Uh, and uh, Jimmy was uh, very gracious to essentially put together all the, the backbone here to be able to, for me to be able to share these with the broader community. So a, a big thank you to Jimmy for making this possible. Um, but we're gonna have four webinars over the next year. We're gonna have one a quarter. The one today is fundamentals of GCLs. This is really why do GCLs work and where do they work well and where do I need to be a little careful about where I use them and I might be looking at something else. Second webinar, which will be next quarter, will be on bentonite polymer composite GCLs. These are the new products that you'll see in the industry. Uh, that are both a conventional GCL, but they also have a, a polymer hydrogel blended in with the bentonite, and they have a very broad range of conditions that they can be used over, and they have a lot of special attributes, which are quite a bit different than conventional GCLs that we need to be aware of. Um, in the third quarter, we're going to talk a lot about testing. Uh, we, In the end, we need to evaluate the efficacy of a GCL and the chemical environment we're going to place it in. That ha has become very complex with a number of liquids that we're dealing with. They range from highly acidic to highly alkaline, from dilute to extremely uh, concentrated. How do we evaluate the chemical compatibility of, of all GCL products? What are the methods we use? What are the things that we need to be aware of? A lot of lessons learned in that. And then finally, we're gonna wrap up the series with really practical lessons learned from GCL case histories. I've been fortunate in my career uh, to spend uh, a lot of time working on real projects, uh, in some cases where products worked really well, in cases where there was a mistake made and we learned a lot from lessons learned from associated with mistakes. So our last uh, webinar uh, in the fourth quarter of this uh, series will be on case histories and lessons learned. Each webinar, each participant will get continuing education credits that will be issued through uh, the University of Virginia School of Engineering. So uh, I will be getting a list of the names and email addresses of all the participants. Within a couple of weeks of finishing this, you'll get, be getting an email from me indicating where you can download uh, your continuing education credits. So I know that's important. I'm a professional engineer. I have to keep up my uh, credits for my certification, and I'm sure that's true for most of you as well. And so I'm glad to be able to provide those. And we will have uh, continuing education credits for each one of the webinars as we go through. So what are the topics for today? Let's get down to business. Uh, Let's begin just to talk about GCLs relative to compacted clay barriers. Really, what is it that's so different about GCLs that make them a product of choice? Uh, then let's begin to talk about, you know, why, why do they work so well? You know, why do GCLs have such low hydraulic conductivity? They really do have remarkable ability to control flow. And where, what are kind of the limits to that range as well? When do they become more permeable? We know that they work really well in a cer certain circumstances, others not so much. So where is that boundary between when things are working well and when things uh, are not working satisfactorily? How can we uh, determine that? How can we measure it? How can we predict it? Uh, how, how can I determine if it's gonna work for my application? The second bullet, that it's really about more general principles, what do I do in my application? I'm designing a facility, for example, a coal combustion facility. I've got a leachate chemistry. Is a GCL gonna work for that? What type of GCL? How do I specify that? We're gonna talk about how I can determine if my GCL will work uh, for my particular liquid that I've got to contain. What do I do if the GCL is gonna be too permeable? What if I go through this process and I found out the conventional GCLs don't work. Well, what, what can I do? Do I have to go back to a compacted clay liner or do I look at other products? Uh, we'll talk about that as well. And then finally, a lot of this is going to deal with the hydraulics and the chemistry uh, of GCLs in the early part. But then I want to talk about some very practical aspects at the end. A lot of the early part is about liners, but we use GCLs in covers just as well. And environmental factors like freeze-thaw and wet-dry are often an issue of concern. They certainly are a major concern with compacted clay liners. Do we have the same issues with GCLs? And if we do, how do we 
how do we engineer around them? So we'll be going through these different issues today. Hopefully by the end of the webinar, you will be an expert on each one of those. Uh, one thing I should mention, uh, my email address is on the first slide and I, we will post these slides for all of you to download at your convenience um, after the webinar. So if um, you can download those and, and uh, you can, my email address will be there. I will be sending out an email to everybody. Uh, and if you have questions, feel free to email me. The whole idea behind this is to share what we've learned so that we can all do our jobs better and, and promote the success of our industry. All right, let's begin. Uh, let's talk about uh, uh, really the basic ideas. We're creating barriers. Uh, you know, I think about my career has largely been developed around uh, engineering wrappers that go around waste. We create wrappers that isolate waste, one from the atmosphere, and, and the other at the base from groundwater. We're gonna talk about lining systems in the base using GCLs there. A lot of our discussion today will be about liners, but we're gonna talk about final covers at the end here briefly um, to provide some contrast and talk about some of the environmental issues. The basic ideas are the same. We're using a GCL, whether it's in a liner or a cover to block the flow primarily of liquids and sometimes gases, but that's our primary goal. But the conditions under which they're exposed in these two different applications are very, very different. Uh, in a liner, we've got an environment where we may have a much more concentrated liquid. We've got high stress and that's advantageous. Uh, we've got a condition where it will be buried, perhaps under tens of meters <clears throat> of material above that will provide a high degree of protection from the outside environment. And so a liner both has challenges with chemical conditions, which are perhaps more severe, but it also has attributes with higher stress, a condition that promotes hydration, uh, a condition that promotes closure of any defects. A cover on the other hand, really we're there, we're talking about ma managing rainwater that's infiltrating through the soil, keeping it out of the waste but the environment is quite a bit different. It's under a low stress condition, it may get very cold. Uh, we may get freezing. I've designed um, uh, final covers in the most arid, hottest deserts of the world and some of the coldest persons places of the world. And they have very contrasting conditions for cover systems. Uh, so the environments are different and we need to think about those. We think about the application of a GCL and engineered barriers, we're almost always using them in a composite system, a combination of a high density polyethylene or some type of geomembrane, doesn't have to be HDPE, as part of a multi-layer sandwich like I show here on the left. We've got waste, we've got a, a leachate collection system, perhaps with a protective layer and some gravel, but underneath that is our liner. We've got a geomembrane underneath conventionally a compacted clay liner. And at least for municipal solid waste, that has to be at least two feet thick, that compacted clay layer. And we put that on a prepared subgrade. That's a conventional liner system. Historically has been. The more, what I would argue is a, a more common lining system today is what we see on the right, where we've replaced that thick compacted clay liner, which works well with a much thinner geosynthetic clay liner, which works equally well and can be a lot easier to install. And in fact, uh, um, is a lot more uh, uh, predictable and reliable in terms of its, uh, its properties. So we can use GCLs uh, to our advantage, uh, certainly a lot more rapid construction, cost-effective construction. We can deploy them quickly and easily relative to a compacted clay liner. We can also save you know, a half a meter or more of airspace uh, just by using a thinner product that works equally well, if not better. This is particularly advantageous in clay pour areas. For example, I've been uh, working with one of the disposal companies in finding alternatives to their designs in central Wisconsin in the uh, upper Midwestern United States. And in that particular region, clay is scarce. Uh, a, a lining system built with a GCL can be a very, very effective alternative in those type of regions. What's pretty remarkable, as I show schematically here, as you think about it, a, a we've got a composite liner with a leachate collection system on the left here with a compacted clay with a geomembrane. Uh, 
here on the left, that, that yellow compacted clay layer with the thick uh, plastic, black plastic geomembrane on top. And we can take something that may be a half a meter or a meter thick and replace it with a GCL that's on the order of 10 millimeters, eight millimeters thick, you know, thinner than the thickness of your index finger. And yet it will function equally well. That's pretty remarkable that we can replace that very thick natural compacted clay barrier with a very thin factory manufactured clay barrier and it will work extremely well. Why does that work? Well, we'll find out. And certainly the construction aspects are pretty, are, are much, much simpler. Building a compacted clay liner, I, I cut my teeth in this, I spent decades working on compacted clay liners. We can make them really well, but they are hard work to do well. So we have to characterize the soil, we gotta have a lot of quality control. Uh, there's a lot of construction process. GCLs are just a lot easier to build with. We're deploying it, uh, essentially, uh, I don't wanna oversimplify it, but it's like rolling out a carpet, just like we would do with other geosynthetics. We prepare the subgrade properly, we roll out the products, and away we go. It's pretty remarkable that we can take a relatively dry sheet of material, roll it out, it will hydrate on a subgrade and become something that's essentially impermeable. Why does that happen? And under what conditions? We'll learn about that today. One of the attributes of GCLs as well is that we, we roll them out in panels and we overlap them, right? We do the overlap. I can't think of how many times I've done this. Uh, and we don't have to weld or physically bond that overlap. We just overlap them together. Typically, we, uh, at least I typically tend to do, I tend to put a stream of bentonite in that overlap between the two. I think that's good practice. Uh, different manufacturers have different products and some suggest that you don't need a, a, a stream or a fillet of, of bentonite down that overlap. I tend to prefer that. The projects I work on when I write specifications, <clears throat> I include that fillet of bentonite and, I just showed down here some of the tests that we did a number of years back looking at the leakage rates through seams. And whenever we put supplemental bentonite or that fillet of bentonite down the seam, uh, that tended to give us a lower flow rate and a more reliable system. I think the jury's still out on the need on that, but in my specifications that I work on and the projects that I'm involved with, I recommend putting this fillet of bentonite in between the layers. But so we have two layers, we put a stream of bentonite down the middle, we overlap them, we build on top. That's pretty remarkable. Um, GCLs come in a number of different types. Perhaps the most common today is the one I show at the top here, a needle punch product. We'll see more of that as we go forward. But there are still are adhesive bonded products around. Uh, these days, we're seeing a lot more interest in laminated GCL products. I show down here at the bottom. Uh, here we have a GCL and it may be just a um, bentonite that's glued onto a gym membrane or more commonly these days where we'll have a, a needle punch non-woven GCL with a gym membrane laminated right to it, essentially creating a, a, a factory installed composite liner in one material. Uh, and those can be overlapped. And in some cases, people will actually weld a cap strip over those. That's not very common. I haven't done that uh, very much myself. But I have used the geomembrane laminated products a lot in the last uh, five years with a high degree of success. And a little later on in the series of, of webinars, we're gonna talk about those in some of the case histories and how well they've worked. But the, the lack of having to put a physical weld or seam is a real advantage of GCLs. We roll them out, they're overlapped, prefer to put a fillet of bentonite in the, in, in the overlap and away we go. Other aspects which are pretty uh, strong uh, attributes of GCLs is the conductivities are very low. I've shown you here on the, on the left. Uh, at the lowest stresses, we're down in the low 10 to the minus nine centimeters per second level. This is data from a whole series of different GCLs that we tested uh, about a decade ago, or not quite a decade, but about seven years ago, uh, with under a wide range of conditions permeated with just with water and at different stresses. And it was remarkable, all the different products, all the different conditions, how similar uh, 
the hydraulic conductivities are. They tend to be very low and very reproducible. I show in the right an example of the reproducibility. This was a really neat uh, uh, round robin study that Dave Daniel and some of his colleagues did a number of years ago where they took GCL samples and sent them out to different laboratories. So in evaluating both the reproducibility of the lab and the variability in the product and highly reproducible uh, hydraulic conductivities. You don't get that with compacted clay. That's really quite a bit different. With GCLs, the products are highly reproducible, highly reliable, and the hydraulic conductivities uh, are very low under the right circumstances. The other aspects that are of real advantages relative to compacted clay liners, they tend to be self-sealing. This is some early experiments done by Dave Daniel again with one of his students being able to show that really up to quarter uh, or 25 millimeter diameter um, uh, punctures can self-seal with essentially no impact on the hydraulic conductivity. And I think the classic photograph is the one shown on the right. I've had this in my files forever. I don't even know where it came from. I wish I did know. But with the bolt penetrating through the GCL and the bentonite just uh, sealing around it. Modest size punctures are self-sealing, and that's a real advantage. The overlaps, we also know that the overlaps are very effective. There's been lots of tests on this. These are some of the early tests. i just give you an example at the top, looking at needle punch GCLs, which are most common today. Tests done with intact GCL, six inch overlaps, three inch overlaps, identical hydraulic conductivities, consistently finding that uh, from uh, product to product and test to test. So the overlaps that we build, and particularly if we add a, a fillet of bentonite in them, are very, very effective. So why does this work? Why do these products work the way they do? Why are they so impervious? Well, uh, it, it all comes down to the, the conditions under which they hydrate. And we begin to look at what, what, it, what is a GCL. And I show in this drawing here on the right, uh, we have a typical cross-section of a needle punch GCL. We have granular bentonite on the inside. These are bentonite granules. They're really granular, what we would call granular, but it could be powdered just as well. Uh, we have a, a jetextile on the top, a jetextile on the bottom, and needle punching fibers that are drawn through it that provide reinforcement. The needle punching fibers are there to reinforce the product. Now this doesn't look too impermeable in that drawing. In fact, it looks pretty permeable. It looks like sand. And in fact, a lot of uh, particularly North American uh, GCL products, the bentonite granules are on the order of what we would, a geotechnical engineer would call our sand sized particles. So in just on a particle size basis, it looks pretty permeable. So for that product to become impermeable, what's on the interior of those bentonite granules have to tr tr be transformed. That's a chemical hydration process that occurs once we install the GCL. We put it down on the subgrade, moisture begins to flow up from, from below. It will either flow up from capillary action, it will also flow up in the vapor phase from the subgrade, and it will begin to interact with that bentonite, or so-called hydrate the bentonite. The bentonite has a tremendous affinity for water molecules. And ideally what we would like to see happen is that granular material I show in the upper uh, diagram transforms into this gel in the lower photograph. In fact, this is a GCL that I exhumed from a field site that I worked on in one of the hottest, driest deserts in North America with a pre annual precipitation on the order of about 100 millimeters a year or four inches of rain. That GCL in that environment was extremely impervious because it transformed in its operative condition into a gel. So what makes that happen? Well, it's special because the, the bentonites that we use are so-called sodium bentonites, or they, meaning that they have sodium cations or positively charged sodium ions that are bound to the mineral surface. Uh, and that sodium bentonite is a special product. When it hydrates under the right con chemical conditions, it will transform into that gel-like product that's very, very impermeable, where the pores are on the size of nanometers as opposed to micro uh, micrometers or millimeters, extremely small pores through which the liquid has to flow. That means 
causes a very low hydraulic conductivity. On the other hand, on the other hand, if they don't swell, if they look like these granules I show here, it will be very, very permeable. So the effectiveness of these products, conventional GCL products with sodium bentonite, is all driven on whether that bentonite will transform from its granular state, whether it's true a granular product or powdered, but a particulate material to a hydrated gel type material that we see in the bottom. If they don't, um, if the particles don't swell and they don't form that, that gel structure, which we call osmotic swelling, the hydraulic conductivity indeed will be very high. Uh, and so let's understand uh, what conditions give rise to that. And I show these uh, mechanisms to show here illustratively, I give, give credit to Sarah Gastitis, one of my PhD students who created this diagram. She's uh, really uh, um, remarkable at some of the visual aids she's been able to produce. But the basic idea is if we, the bentonite granules swell and they essentially meld together, forming that gel, the pores through which liquid has to flow are very, very small, very, very tortuous, and the flow rate is extremely low. On the other hand, if they don't swell, the pores remain open, the flow path is large, and the hydraulic conductivity is very high. It's not unlike pipes in a pipe network. We have a pipe network made of tiny itty bitty pipes, no flow will go through it. Big massive pipes like we would have in a, in a force main or in a city street, uh, much higher capacity to drive flow. So what is special about montmorillonite that allows this transformation to occur? Montmorillonite is a really, it's a special, or bentonite, the component, is, is made primarily of the mineral montmorillonite, which is a special clay mineral. It's a so-called two-to-one mineral, meaning it has uh, uh, a two-to-one structure made up of uh, a basic two-to-one building block with a, a tetrahedral sheet, and two tetrahedral sheets around an octahedral sheet, uh, and those sheets uh, tend to be stacked together, but they're not physically uh, bound in between. And these sheets will tend to separate when they hydrate, and water will surround that uh, mineral structure and hydrate it, and uh, in a, really a, a very enormous a quantity of liquid. And we can think of that separation of the sheets themselves, that's essentially, that's the swelling behavior. So water will make its way into this interface, water molecules will accumulate, it will push the sheets apart, and the uh, uh, granules will swell and the material will become uh, less and less permeable. Um, if we think about, it, it's, as I indicated, it's a two to one mineral that's weak inner layer bonds that allow separation. The other aspects of it is when, when it separates and we get water in that so-called inner layer zone, the surface area is enormous, 800 meters squared per gram, right? So if you think of a small one gram of dry bentonite, that's got a football field of surface area. That's remarkable. And not only is it a large area, but it's also an area that's negatively charged. And because it's negatively charged, it has an affinity for positively charged ions and water molecules. So it's got a really big surface area. It's also negative, it's got a high negative charge and it's really reactive. So it really wants to uh, affiliate with water molecules, but because it's reactive, it also makes it sen very sensitive to the geochemical conditions. And the amount of separation or the amount of swelling of those sheets will depend a lot on the geochemical conditions that exist in the application we have. Uh, there was early work done in this, uh, actually predates me many, many years, actually in the 1950s by a, a clay chemist called Norris, who studied the separation of the layers in bentonite and how it uh, varied with the chemistry. And I always like to go back to his graph because I think it really tells the story. This is an, an odd graph, that's that spacing I showed earlier, and we just think of that as more swell going up on the y-axis, but the x-axis is, is a little odd. This is the uh, co concentration of the hydrating solution, but it's in odd units. It's one over the square root of the co concentration of the solution. Uh, and this is the typical engineers and scientists, particularly academics, are always trying to find a way to 
uh, create the axes so that we get a nice linear line, and that's what Norris did. Uh, so it's got somewhat weird units on the x-axis, one over the square root of concentration. But you can think of on the left side of the x-axis, that's really concentrated. And on the y, the, the right-hand side of the x-axis, moving all the way to the right, that's really dilute, all right? So you can see here that as we go from very concentrated, we get very little swell over to very concentrated, excuse me, to very dilute where we get a whole lot of swell. Again, concentrated, no swelling, dilute, a lot of swelling. And of course, the swelling is what we want to uh, achieve low hydraulic conductivity. The swelling occurs in actually two steps. One's called crystalline swelling, where we get a couple of layers of water molecules around the bentonite surface. And then after that, it goes into what's called osmotic swelling. And this is where the magic of bentonite is, where multiple layers of water molecules surround the bentonite, the montmorillonite mineral, forcing separation and uh, creating more and more swelling and that gel type structure that we see. Now there's some interesting aspects of this that Norris showed. First of all, one, as I indicated, when it's concentrated, we only get crystalline swelling and there's very little swelling. When it's dilute, we get both crystalline and osmotic swelling and we tend to get, if it's very dilute, we'll get a lot of swelling, all right? So dilute liquids really create impermeable barriers, really concentrated, more problems. So you might think of brines, yeah, that's going to be a problem. Now what adds to the complexity of this is the valence is important as well. If we have predominantly polyvalent cations, meaning that the charge is plus two or plus three, like calcium magnesium being plus two, they will prevent osmotic swelling from occurring. So it's not only the concentration, but it's also the type of ions that are in solution. On the other hand, if we have primarily monovalence like sodium, uh, we'll get a lot of swelling provided it's not too concentrated. So it's not only the, the concentration, but it's also the valence. And that both of them are going to be important. We're going to talk about that. For bentonite swelling, chemistry matters. It's, in fact, it's all about the chemistry. And um, as a, a person who was trained as a geotechnical engineer, a civil engineer, as an undergraduate, the chemistry mattering wasn't at the top of my priority list. As I've gone through my career, this has become the most important aspect of understanding how the behavior of these systems uh, exists and understanding the chemistry is important. That's some fundamentals. Let's look at some practical photographs. Uh, these are some tests that we did uh, a number of years back. This is great geotechnical instrumentation that, that we have in the laboratories with plastic uh, kitchenware uh, and the plastic uh, um, rule but in fact, very practical. What I'm showing you in this uh, uh, set of photographs are two different experiments we ran and what was the called at the time the GCL1 swell test that the Geosynthetic Research Institute, as it was known at the time, had developed. This was essentially like a compaction mold where we would put a thin layer of bentonite in the bottom of the compaction mold. We would put a plate on top and an LVDT, and then we would pour the liquid of interest on top of the bentonite. And so you can imagine a, a, a compaction mold with a thin layer of bentonite in the bottom. And if I pour DI water in it, that thin layer would swell into this thick gel gelatinous patty. That's what I see right here on the, on the top. That's osmotic swelling, that's in deionized water. We start, we'll get a little bit of crystalline and almost all osmotic swelling. That bentonite layer, which starts off at, you know, really about maybe five millimeters thick, swells to on the order of about 40 millimeters thick, almost 10 times its original thickness. Do the exact same experiment with granular bentonite in the, in the mold, pour a 50 millimeter calcium chloride solution, different chemistry, divalent, more concentrated. Let's take a look at the outcome. What happens? In this experiment, no swelling. Exactly the same bentonite, exactly the same amount of water. The only thing we've changed is the are the ions in the water. You can, in fact, if you look carefully at that photograph at the bottom, I don't see any, any uh, swelling going on. In fact, I see the original bentonite granules, right? In fact, it's virtually had no swelling whatsoever. It almost looks dry, but it has been immersed in a 50 millimeter calcium chloride solution. 
so that you can imagine this uh, betonite that's been hydrated with DI water and form that osmotic swelling in the gel, very impermeable. The one in the bottom, highly permeable, looks like sand. Chemistry matters. The way we look at that today is with a swell index test. Uh, just to give you an example, typically we take a 100 mil graduated cylinder, uh, and in that cylinder we fill it with liquid, and then we add a little uh, two grams of dry betonite. We uh, uh, crush the dry betonite first, and then we add it very slowly in the top. But two grams of dry bentonite, just showing it in a 100 mil graduated cylinder shown here on the left, just that dry little particulate in the bottom. If we actually sprinkled that into deionized water, that small amount of, of particulate would swell an enormous amount. In fact, here we show on the right, here it's swelling about uh, 17 um, uh, milliliters per two grams. So we have weird units on that, milliliters per two grams. That actually is not a lot of swelling. This is a fairly concentrated liquid we've used. The swelling's been suppressed. Uh, in fact, with deionized water, we might get something with a good quality betonite on the order of 32 or 34 uh, milliliters per two grams. This is a great simple test that tells us a lot about the ability for betonite to swell in different solutions. We're gonna come back to this. So we can look at that swelling behavior with, with simple tools like this very effectively. This is actually a test that came out of the pharmaceutical industry, uh, not from our industry. We, we tend to borrow a lot of things and put geo in front of it and call them our own. Well, as you might imagine, if we looked at the swelling behavior of the betonite in different solutions and the hydraulic conductivity, that they would be really strongly correlated. And that's what this graph shows here. This is actually some work uh, done by Ho Young Jo, one of my PhD students a number of years back, where he ran different tests on GCLs, uh, all the same GCLs. All he did was vary was the chemistry. He changed the concentration and he changed the salt so that the valence was different. He used salts like lithium chloride and sodium chloride and potassium chloride, which are monovalent, calcium and magnesium and zinc uh, chloride salts, which are divalent. And then he used a trivalent, uh, excuse me, a trivalent salt, the lanthium chloride here at the bottom. Uh, regardless of what salt we used or what concentration, we got a strong relationship between the hydraulic conductivity and the swell index. And being academics, we have to normalize everything. So we normalized it by the volume of dry bentonite, and we normalized it by the hydraulic conductivity of DEI water. But for all practical purposes, I could have graphed hydraulic conductivity on the Y, swell index on the X, and I would get this type of behavior. If I get very little swell, the hydraulic conductivity is gonna be high because I essentially have a granular product through which liquid is flowing, large pores. I get a lot of swell, I fill those pores with that swollen gelatinous bentonite, uh, and I have very low, have very low uh, small pores conducting flow and very, very low hydraulic conductivity. So with all that complexity of discussion about chemistry, we see that we can capture it with these very simple principles of the swell index test and the swelling of bentonite. If it, the chemical environment allows it to swell, it will be relatively impermeable. If it does not, it will be relatively permeable. It's really that simple. In fact, we look at here at deionized water out here on this normalized graph. Many of these salts are behaving just like deionized water because they're allowing it to swell. Let's talk a little bit more about some of the specifics though about concentration and valence and how they affect hydraulic conductivity. This graph illustrates that really nicely. Over here on the left, we show deionized water. Uh, DW. That's essentially water with no ions in it. And we're hydrating the bentonite and permeating the GCL with that liquid. We're getting a hydraulic conductivity around 10 to the minus 9, 3 times 10 to the minus 9 centimeters per second. Really, really low. That bentonite is swelling uh, like crazy. It's a gel. It's All the pores are very tiny. The water molecules are struggling to make their way through the bentonite. It's really impervious. Now, let's just change that liquid. Instead of using deionized water, distilled water, let's use a, a dilute calcium solution. And here I've used something very dilute, but it's calcium, it's divalent. It's, and those divalent ions are gonna interact differently with the bentonite. It's five millimolar, that's like tap water. Do the same experiment and it's 10 times higher, right? 
10 times higher hydraulic conductivity with the calcium chloride just by changing the valence of the cation by putting calcium in there. And in fact, I can make take it up to on the order of about 20 and nothing not much happens. But I get to a point where I take it, make it even more concentrated with the calcium and it gets really permeable. I have essentially eliminated the swelling of that bentonite. And in fact, you know, I'm, I'm up here at 10 to the minus six centimeters per second. That's not a very effective barrier. So there, there's a range over conditions in which it works really well and a range where it doesn't. Now let's look at the other salts, the sodium chloride and the potassium chloride. They're both monovalent as opposed to that calcium chloride which is divalent. They have one charge per uh, per uh, atom of sodium or potassium relative to two charges for a calcium. Same exact concentration, just change the valence. Orders of magnitude different hydraulic conductivity. So I can, with a monovalence, I can go a much broader range of concentration before I get uh, any alteration hydraulic conductivity. But even so, if I make any solution very concentrated, and here I've got a, a one molar sodium chloride solution, we get end up with a, a, a permeable system. So the concentration and the valence are important. Uh, we tend to capture those in a couple of variables that are um, uh, pretty simple to compute. And if you've got leachate chemistry, these are really easy things to compute straight away. I have a little spreadsheet in my desktop to do this. The I, What we call ionic strength is kind of a total measure of strength, of concentration. Uh, we have the concentration of the I, I, ion in solution and the valence. And so it accounts for different charges associated with different cations. And so we're essentially adding up all the different charges in solution and, and to get a essentially a, a master uh, concentration or ionic strength for the solution. And then we have another parameter called RMD, which is the ratio of monovalent to divalent cations. And we normal, generalize that over time really to be all the polyvalent cations. So we take all the molarity of the monovalents, the sodiums, the potassiums, uh, the lithiums, and then we add up all the polyvalents, the calciums, the magnesiums, the aluminums, uh, and we create this ratio of RMD. So a, a really uh, low RMD or zero, that would be all polyvalent. So a calcium chloride solution would be zero. A sodium solution would be infinite, all right? So RMD goes from very low to very high, very low being divalent or polyvalent, really high being monovalent. And we see that there's a clear effect on hydraulic conductivity of GCLs as we, and I, these are just some experiments. Actually, these were experiments that Dale Kolstad ran. Dale, I, I talked to Dale, I've talked to him for years, but he's with Bar Engineering. I talked to him today. Uh, and Dale did these experiments a number of years back where he just varied the ionic strength and varied the RMD of the solution. And as you might expect, as we make the solution more concentrated, it becomes more permeable. And as we change it from a more monovalent solution shown here in blue to a more divalent solution, it becomes more, uh, shown in red, it becomes more permeable. We see that consistently. The, the monovalents have lower hydraulic conductivity than the polyvalent solutions. The more polyvalent it is, the, the higher the hydraulic conductivity. The more concentrated it is, the higher the hydraulic conductivity. Now, how can you get a handle on that? Well, one thing that Dale did with his work is develop uh, an equation that allows us, if we know the hydraulic conductivity to DI water, which is typically about two times to the minus nine centimeters per second for most GCLs, we can calculate what the hydraulic conductivity to a chemical solution would be if we know the ionic strength and the RMD, easy variables to compute from the chemistry. So we can estimate it. So what does this mean in terms of real leachates? I've been talking about a lot of basic principles. What does this mean about real leachates? Well, when we begin, a lot of the early work with GCLs was with uh, municipal solid waste leachates. Uh, and we had great experience with municipal solid waste leachates. And that was somewhat fortuitous in many ways because it turns out that most, as we'll see, uh, municipal solid waste leachates, while they tend to have a lot of ions in them, are not too concentrated. And they tend to have a preponderance or an abundance of monovalence, particularly sodium, because sodium salts are in a lot of waste and they're very soluble, but also uh, ammonia as well. We get a lot of ammonia in solid waste landfills and ammonia is a 
monovalent ion as well as the ammonium ion in solution. So concentrations tend to be modest. The valence tends to be monovalent. That's a very favorable setting. And if we look at, for example, these different experiments here, you can see under a broad range of stresses, we got very, very low hydraulic conductivities, the municipal solid waste leachates with GCLs. And this is why one of the reasons why GCLs have been so successful in MSW landfills. They just work with MSW leachates really, really well. Now, the picture gets a little different when we begin to look at other liquids. And this is what's really driven a lot of change in the industry over the last decade as we've been dealing with coal ashes, uh, bauxite liquors, other types of mining waste. I, I deal with a low level radioactive waste business. Some people have been dealing with frack water ponds for, uh, for uh, uh, oil and gas um, production. And so we begin to look at these different leachates, we get a very different story. And um, so our, our municipal solid waste leachates, if we make a graph of RMD versus ionic strength, so the two master variables I talked about before, again, to the right is more concentrated, and then to the lower left or a smaller RMD is more divalent. The, the MSW leachates, which is that cluster of very fine black dots, but on average, they tend to fall right in the middle. You know, they're just ideally suited for GCLs or GCLs are ideally suited for MSW leachates. But things get a little different. You know, like we deal with some low level waste leachates. I deal with the low level waste leachates uh, for Department of Energy. Some of those leachates can be really, really divalent. They're not any concentrated in MSW leachates, but because we use a lot of grouts for stabilizing uh, radioactive waste forms, we can end up with very, very divalent leachates. Or if we're dealing with bauxite liquors, I do a lot of work with the aluminum industry. Bauxite liquors are strong sodium hydroxide solutions, one molar, two molar, three molar solutions. Some of the flowback waters from uh, frack waters from oil and gas production, incinerator ashes can be up in this range. So much, much more concentrated. Uh, some hazardous waste leachates uh, can be way up in that, that corner as well. In fact, I should just remark, I've been dealing with some coal combustion product waste leachates, which are actually off my chart. They're way up here past the upper right-hand corner. And other things, you know, some of the extreme coal combustion product leachates, heap leach we, leachates, they're different. They're not like MSW leachates. So what we know about MSW leachates may not apply to these other liquids. And so we need to begin to think about the impacts of that. Just, just put a little bit in context. A, a, a seawater is about 700 millimolar salt water, all right, 700 millimolar. We're dealing with some solutions which are much more concentrated than, than seawater. So they're very, very salty, and we still got to contain them. When we begin to look at these liquids, most of them, Ionic strength, their total concentration is the predominant variable that's affecting their hydraulic conductivity. That's what I've shown here on this graph. This is actually a set of experiments we did for Electric Power Research Institute uh, with diff different GCL products here, just showing an A and a B, with different coal ash leachates that we uh, assembled from a large database that the EPRI had uh, created. And you can see very clearly here that as the ionic strength goes up for these different coal ash leachates, the hydraulic conductivity changes orders of magnitude. For some leachates, it's low. Others, it's much, much higher. And so being able to understand the impact of that chemistry is important. The RMD is important as well, but for most of these ionic strengths, the biggest driver. Fortunately, some of these, swell, these tests, are the simple tests we have are really handy. The swell index test, can be really handy to determine whether we've got a potential incompatibility with a conventional bentonite. This example here is shown with hydraulic conductivity versus swell index measured with D5890. Uh, these are some recent data that we created with coal combustion product leachates for two different products, two different conventional GCLs, a red and a blue. And we can see almost a straight line between the log of hydraulic conductivity and the log of swell index. The only caveat uh, is that the relationship, if you use an empirical relationship like this, it has to be developed with the bentonite in the product that you're using. Uh, it's, they're not universal relationships because the gradation of those bentonites is changing, the minerals are 
the mines in which they're coming from, the blends are changing. So we need to have the product, the bentonite from the manufacturer and understand the, that bentonite's relationship between hydraulic conductivity and swell index. Um, but that's a really handy parameter. For If you're gonna deal with most conventional North American GCLs today with coal combustion product leachates, this line here that I've shown works great. But this relationship with swell index is very, very handy. Uh, another test that's often used is a fluid loss test where we create a slurry. I don't use this very often, I find it more cumbersome, but essentially we create a slurry of bentonite, we put it in a vessel, we apply pressure to it and we measure how much liquid flows out of it. That's called filtrate or fluid loss. And we can get a relationship between that the fluid loss and hydraulic conductivity as well. So these are really handy uh, tests to run. Ultimately, where we need to get at though, these we can use tests like that. We can start off with something like the Kolstad equation to do some calculations about what we're likely to get. Then we might do a swell index test with our, le our, our leachate that we expect, or perhaps synthetic. Does the swell index seem reasonable? Typically, we wanna see a swell index at least 15 milliliters per two gram, preferably over 20. If that looks good, then we need to go to a hydraulic conductivity test. We're actually gonna take a specimen, put it in a permeameter, and flow the liquid through it and determine the hydraulic conductivity that we get. Uh, we normally do that with ASTM D6766. That's the GCL analog to D5084 for soil. They're very similar standards. I've been involved in both of them, development of both of them. Uh, they're used in a so-called flexible wall permeameter, which I show here on the left, where we essentially have a, a GCL, a, a circular GCL sample sandwiched between two caps and a, and a uh, latex membrane surrounding it, and we flow water from from through the GCL, actually bottom to top, uh, and we run that test to equilibrium. Things that we need to think about when we're running these tests, what's the, is the prehydration condition is important. When with a liquid contacts the bentonite, has that bentonite wetted up at all from its subsurface environment or its subgrade? We'll talk about that effect of stress, hydraulic equilibrium, chemical equilibrium, how important, these are important variables to consider. We're gonna have a later webinar where we go over a great set of detail on testing, but we'll talk about these uh, uh, in some more generalities today. One of the most important things of running these tests is that we actually have to run them long enough. There's a tendency, uh, certainly in our lab, we get commercial tests, we run a commercial lab, and we have clients that always want the test done tomorrow or more frequently yesterday. Um, that's just common, but we can't rush rush these tests. The test runs at the rate at which it runs, and we need to make sure that we meet the termination criteria to have a reliable outcome. First thing we look at, is the hydraulic conductivity changing with time? No upward or downward trend. Is the flow in and out of the specimen steady? Are we getting comparable inflow and outflow? Have we had enough volume of flow for chemical interactions to occur? We use at least two pore volumes unless otherwise specified by the person requesting the test, at least two pore volumes, meaning that the volume of voids in the GCL, we have to at least flush two times the volume, that volume with liquid. A lot of times it may take 20 or 30 pore volumes to get the equilibrium. And do we see steady uh, electrical conductivity? We use that as a surrogate of concentration. Is the electrical conductivity of the effluent comparable to that of the influent? These tests can take time. This is an example from our laboratory. These are long-term tests. So difficulty with going to graduate school in my group, your test, your research can take a very long time to come to equilibrium. But we think in practice, we, if we ran a test, a, a regular hydraulic conductivity test, and it took more than 15 days, that would be unusual. But we can look at the data here and you can see that things are changing in these experiments, certainly during the first 40 days, but perhaps over an entire year later, chemical interactions are occurring very slowly. Now, this isn't necessarily universal, these very long times I've shown here, but the chemical equilibrium times are much longer than we're used to. And, and yet it's critical that we allow chemical equilibrium to occur to ensure that we've got a reliable outcome. How long do we need to run the tests? Uh, here's some examples for tests that we ran for three years. 
All right, that's a very long-term test. It took nearly one year to get to the termination criteria in ASTM D6766. So our electrical conductivity and steady flow criteria took about, about a year, right up in here. To get the full chemical equilibrium took nearly two years when the chemistry of the effluent was comparable to that, essentially what was coming out of the specimen was what was coming into the specimen. That we no longer had chemical interactions occurring. So the test can take a long time to run uh, f um, under certain circumstances. Be prepared for that. I talked about prehydration. Is that important? One of the things that's often considered uh, based on some of the literature is what if we have uh, wetted the GCL with something that was uh, less concentrated early on? You know, for example, if we pumped water through it, would that provide us with some chemical protection? We call that prehydration. And what we know from practice is that while we can run experiments, research experiments, and show that we can get a prehydration effect that will prevent changes in hydraulic conductivity from occurring, what we do know is that in the, the, high, the water contents that we need to achieve that protect, protection are not realized in the field from subgrade hydration. A GCL will hydrate, hydrate in the field and a subgrade up to a water content of 80 to 100% or so, gravimetric. To get the impacts of subgrade prehydration, uh, pre we have to be on the order of 200% water content or more. Uh, so we don't see that very commonly. And just to illustrate that, just to some experiments we ran with different GCLs with different, this is work with coal combustion product leachates where we did hydration experiments directly on a subgrade, where we put the GCL in a moist subgrade, we allowed it to hydrate, and after it hydrated for 60 days, we permeated it with the coal combustion product leachate. And typically, and after that hydration period, we have water contents of 80 to 100%. And what we found is that the hydraulic conductivity of the subgrade prehydrated sample and the hydraulic conductivity of a GCL directly permeated by uh, the CCP leachate without hydration were essentially the same. Almost no impact of hydration. So uh, the, we often talk about prehydration as being a way to ameliorate um, uh, chemical interactions, but realistically, it's not something we can count on. We need a GCL that we can permeate directly with the liquid and have low hydraulic conductivity. What about leachates we might use? You know, if, if we need to run a test like D6766, can, do we need to have the actual leachate or can we send the chemistry to the lab and have them make something up? Well, it, it we've studied that. We've looked at uh, re, uh, tests where we've run comparative analyses with synthetic leachates having essentially I nearly identical chemical composition and real leachates. And that's what I show here in this graph, synthetic on the Y, a hydraulic conductivity, the real and the X. And for all practical purposes, they're almost the same. A little bit lower with the real leachate. And that's largely because the real leachates have other stuff in them that we don't get in our synthetics, particulate, other types of phases that we're, we just don't represent accurately in the synthetic leachate. And they tend to plug some of the pores. But we can often use a synthetic, or uh, I use this regularly in our lab, and have confidence that really I'm getting something that's nearly the same as I would get with the actual leachate. So I can have send the, the uh, leachate chemistry to the lab. I can have send that that chemistry to the lab, uh, the testing laboratory, and they can create a leachate and can use it with confidence. So some implications for conventional GCLs. One, we got to understand the chemistry. I said we were the chemistry was a really important. The efficacy of GCLs is all driven by the chemical environment in which they're placed. We need to understand how chemistry affects the swelling of the bentonite and the hydraulic conductivity of the GCL. Fortunately, you know, a, a lot of times uh, the, chem the idea of chemistry gets people, it gets, turns their hair on fire. Uh, they don't like chemistry. Fortunately, we can use some nice simple tests. Swell index test is a great test to look at for screening. As long as we've got a relationship between hydraulic conductivity and swell index for uh, the bentonite that's in the GCL product that you're 
considering. Uh, like to see as at least 15 milliliters per two grams, uh, over 20 would be even better. Uh, plan for testing time. Some of these tests can take a long time. We're gonna validate it, make sure it works. Use the swell index, the fluid loss, the, the Colstat equation for screening to screen out products that aren't gonna work. But make sure when you look at the product that you're gonna test that you put, uh, put enough time in your schedule. This is I see frequently. Uh, is a problem which we just don't plan for that. And the job site's got to be, start construction and we've only got a month and we got to run tests. And it's, well, as you can imagine that the, the timing doesn't work. Uh, plan ahead. Uh, and then finally, it, there's not a whole lot we can rely on for subgrade prehydration. I didn't talk much about stress. We'll talk more about that later in another work uh, webinar. Um, but the chemical effects are not driven greatly by stress either, not ameliorated. So we can't ameliorate chemical interactions in a substantive way, either by prehydrating it on a subgrade or by applying higher stress. The conditions that occur when we, the GCL first gets contacted by leachate, when waste is first placed and liquid is first contacting the, the bentonite tend to be the most important. Uh, and so we, we can't rely on those as factors that are gonna buffer the effects of chemical interactions. We need to pick a product that works with the chemistry of the leachate that we have in hand. What if I, what if none of the G, conventional GCL products work, right? The, what, what if none of them work? I run these tests, I, I gotta build this facility and all my GCLs are really permeable, my conventional ones. They're, they just won't work with the, with my leachate. Do I have to go to compacted clay line? Well, no, not necessarily. You know, these products that have been developed over the last decade or so, and uh, I call them bentonite polymer or composite materials where we take bentonite and we take polymer, blend them together in a dry material, put them into a GCL, roll them out just like we normally would, and they hide, the bentonite and polymer tend to hydrate together. They work collaboratively, we might say, in the GCL. Those products can work with very strong leachates. Uh, bentonite polymer composite is the word that I use for those. We're uh, talk, uh, talking about that as being an ASTM definition, but you also hear these called PMGs or polymer modified GCLs or PMBs for polymer modified bentonites. But what I'm talking about is where we're making a dry blend of a bentonite, either granular or powdered form and polymer to create a a composite material, and it truly is a composite. Both parts have an equally important uh, function, and we'll talk more about those in another webinar. We've got a whole webinar on those. So I want to take a lot, the last few minutes here before we go to questions to talk about some environmental factors. I spent a lot of time talking about really basic issues. When does a conventional GCL work? When will it hydrate? What le leachates will it work? What leachates won't work? How can I evaluate that? Those apply mainly to liners, almost exclusively to liners, not in covers. But we, and we use GCLs in both applications, in the base and in the top. And they can work exceptionally well in both applications. Uh, and in fact, in covers, they work a lot better than compacted clays. Uh, you know, we know about compacted clay barriers. We've done lots of work on this, exhumed lots of compacted clay barriers and covers. They tend to become very permeable over time due to freezing and thawing and wetting and drying. It, those environmental factors really do a lot of damage to, to compacted clays. Do we see the same thing for GCLs? Or are GCLs resilient to these phenomena? Well, the answer to that, like many things, is both yes and no. And we'll talk about when. Uh, let, let's use a case history to begin with, just as an example in the last few minutes here. Uh, I had the, so many of the things in my practice have been developed out of an interesting problem I got to work on where something was not functioning as it was expected. And this was an example. This, this was a site, Southwest Wisconsin, where G, the, this was the first GCL used in a cap in Wisconsin. It was not used with a geomembrane alone. It was just used with a GCL with a surface layer on top of it that was vegetated. And the regulatory agency at the time, they were skeptical. You know, we've been using compacted clay layers for two decades, and now you want to use this newfangled product. 
and you tell me it's going to work, well, prove it, right? Well, put a big drain underneath it, a, a, a lysimeter, and measure its performance. And so they did that. You know, they built this cover and they put some of these panels underneath these lysimeters and collected the leachate. And this is what they found. Uh, they, this was done middle 1990s and um, expected, you know, do your calculations, you expect two, three millimeters of liquid a year coming through a, a GCO and a cap if it's working as it expects. This is cumulative percolation on the Y axis versus time or date on the X axis. And early on, yeah, the flow rate was extremely low. But within a couple of years, we went from having a couple millimeters a year to hundreds of millimeters a year of flow, right? Something was very wrong. The conventional GCLs in this environment, the transmission and percolation are 200 to almost 300 millimeters a year. Uh, and in two different lysimeters, it was reconstructed one time, got the same behavior. First, they thought maybe there was a mistake during construction, we'll rebuild it, uh, see, if, uh, see if we just made a mistake. In fact, they rebuilt it, same thing happened again. You know, this blue line here is went up, rebuilt it, same thing happened. Um, something happened to that GCL. They went back in the in 2000 and rebuilt part of it with a so-called called composite GCL or a laminated GCL that had a GM membrane directly laminated on top of the GCL. And that worked really well, all right? In fact, the percolation rates from this laminated product eventually done in one area and then done in the other on the order of a few millimeters a year, really, really effective. But why did the conventional GCL not work? Well, we went back, we had the opportunity to go back and dig it out. I, I spent a lot of my career digging stuff up that other people have built and they find it interesting trying to understand why things function the way they do. But this is what the bentonite looked like. Look at these desiccation cracks. Well, that bentonite had changed. Those cracks had formed, and what was more important, when it got wetted up again, that bentonite stopped swelling for some reason, right? Well, that bentonite had been around, surrounded by lots of calcium ions in the cover system, and it had transformed that sodium bentonite to a calcium bentonite that no longer swelled, just like we showed before. It's all about swelling. And, uh, and so those, those cracks in the bentonite that formed during drying never swelled back shut when it would get wet again. And, in fact, we did a number of uh, laboratory experiments to be able to show that, where we measured the hydraulic conductivity of GCLs permeated with different waters. We permeated with DI water. We could wet and dry it till no tomorrow. That's the dark green line here. Hydraulic conductivity remained very, very low, regardless of how many drying cycles that we had, or wetting and drying cycles. We did out the five. That's when the student told me she was gonna graduate whether when we were done with the experiments or not. When we used solutions that had calcium in that, simulating what we saw in the cover soils surrounding that GCL, for a few cycles it did okay, but then it became very, very permeable with more wetting cycles because the bentonite lost its ability to swell because of the calcium. It would not swell and became very, very permeable. In fact, we went after that study, we went back and dug up a whole bunch of different caps and all of those that were in which the GCL had dried out had become permeable. Those which remained wet remained relatively impermeable. The wet in-situ water content was high, the GCL was per, uh, relatively impermeable. So the message was simple, don't let it dry out, right? You need to protect the GCL from drying. And so the message is use a gym membrane on top of the GCL. We use that commonly today, that's a composite system or a laminated or a GCLL product, which are very common. I'm gonna talk about those later in the series. Some of our experience with using those in caps, really, really effective. What about freeze thaw cycling? The other side, you know, we know compacted clays are damaged severely by freeze thaw cycling. We have lots of data on that, plethora of it. We see the same thing with GCLs. Well, this is where the story I said, it's gonna be yes and no. GCLs are very resilient to freezing and thawing. Freezing and thawing and wetting and drying are similar in many ways because we have the, the liquid changing phase. You know, in one, when it's drying, it changes to a gas phase and then it evaporates and leaves. And freezing, the liquid changes from a liquid phase where it's hydrating the bentonite to a solid. But the difference is it never dehydrates. The GCL never dehydrates when it's frozen. In fact, 
when it thaws back out, all that water is still there, same place it was before it froze, and it, it's right back there to keep the GCL swollen. We've seen this consistently. This is some work that we did for a, a tailings facility way, way up in, in northern Canada, and we looked at this with and without ion exchange processes, and consistently, over time, the hydraulic conductivity became a little lower, largely because freezing and thawing tends to consolidate the bentonite a little bit over time, making the pores a little smaller and the hydraulic conductivity a little lower. And you can see this, you just look at some photographs of, of frozen GCLs. These are examples in my lab where we cut open frozen GCLs and you see very fine ice lenses in them, right? But look at this one in the bottom, right? Look at how much water is still in there. It's frozen water, but it's water. And when that water melts, that GCL is nice and soft, a nice soft gel and all those ice lenses, the uh, voids in which those lenses exist just melt away as the GCL thaws, and in fact, becoming a little less permeable. So yes, yes and no, wetting and drawing is a problem. We need to put geomembranes over GCLs for them to remain effective in caps. Freezing and thawing, not so. Uh, in fact, we get a little bit of a beneficial effect from freezing and thawing due to that thaw consolidation phenomenon. So what are the lessons learned from today? Well, one, we know GCLs can be really effective. We have 30 plus years experience. Um, there's a lot of great applications for GCLs. They're a lot easier to build with the compacted clay barriers, but we got to understand the chemistry. The chemistry is important. You know, when we're dealing with just municipal solid waste, we were lucky because the chemistry was pretty favorable to, to a conventional bentonite. It allowed the bentonite to swell osmotically and get really low hydraulic conductivity. But a lot of liquids we are dealing with today are not MSW leachates. They're a lot stronger, they're a lot more specific, and they have different effects. And so we're dealing with those liquids, we, we need to do some additional analysis. We begin with doing that with screening, using so-called Colstat equation, swell index test to get a sense, is it gonna work? And then doing chemical compatibility testing with something like ASTM D6766. Again, plan ahead, that may take considerable amount of time. Some practical things, wet dry cycling uh, can be really significant. Uh, you wanna cover the GCL, you never wanna use a GCL on a cap alone. Use it with a gym membrane on top or use a laminated GCL product or a GCLL product. Those products work really well. I have used them at field sites. I've got a plethora of field data I'll be showing later. I showed a bit, a bit of it today. Uh, those laminated products work really, really well. Uh, and finally, uh, what we do know on the flip side of that is that while they may be affected by wetting and drawing, GCLs are not affected by, uh, it should be say freeze thaw cycling, not freeze wet cycling. Um, so that's what I've got for today. What's next? Well, we're gonna, we're at the point now where you know where a GCL, a conventional GCL will work and where it won't. And where, if you're dealing with applications where it won't, then we wanna to go to bentonite polymer composite GCL. These other products I talked about, and these are really interesting products, but they're really different animals. They require different testing. They really require a different frame of mind, different chemical issues. We'll have a, 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 a comprehensive webinar on those products and how to engineer with them in, in next quarter. So that'll be announced. I look forward to presenting that. I've, I spent the last decade working on those products at length. And so that's coming. Uh, we've talked a lot. And as I promised, as a professor, I took up as much oxygen as I could uh, on the presentation. Uh, I know you have a lot of questions. We'll take some here in a moment. But a lot of you are going to leave with questions too, or you're going to have questions tomorrow or next week. My email address is here. Uh, they'll be on the slides. When you get them, you'll also be getting an email from me feel free to reach out with questions. This is all about trying to share what we've learned with a broader community. So uh, please uh, feel free to contact me. I have my work email and then my private email as well. You're free to use either one. So I'm gonna pop it back now. I think what we'll just scroll all the way back to the very beginning. And we're gonna look in the chat box and see what questions we can answer. We've got almost 200 people. This is fantastic. And I bet we've got a bunch of questions. Oh, I got a lot of questions. That's good. We'll get as many as we can today. And, um, uh oh, I just got rid of one. 
by accident. Apologize if uh, the top one, I forgot who that was and I, I missed what your, pre your question was. So if you wanna put it back in, I uh, apologize for that. The chat's a little awkward to use. Tried that it, it's, oh. all right, here we go. I got this out here. Are you gonna be covering lo uh, long-term durability aspects of your GCLs in the upcoming presentations? It's a question that is starting to come up more and more often from clients and regulars, as it should, right? This is less to do with the, with the bentonite and more to do with the textiles. How long will the GCL continue to perform when the leachate starts to degrade the textile components that contain the bentonite and the needle punching between them, particularly when they're used on slopes? Uh, and this is from Jonathan Shamrock. Great question, Jonathan. Yeah, this is a topic that we're gonna have more on in one of the future webinars. Uh, when we talk about compatibility testing, I'll, I'll actually add more of that content into the third webinar. We'll also, when we talk about bentonite polymer composites, I'll put in some of the service life in there as well. Uh, the, you're, you're spot on about the components. The, the bentonite itself, if bentonite works, in the envir chemical environment you have, it's gonna work today and it's gonna work a millennium from now. The, the challenge is with the polymeric components and some of the work that we've done, uh, we've done a good bit of work in the radioactive waste business and for some polymeric just, just synthetic components, we've been able to demonstrate convincingly uh, roughly about 2000 years of service life. So very, very long periods of time. So we'll talk more about that in one of the forthcoming lectures. So Jonathan, thank you for that comment. I've got a question from Joan Larado. I got that right. What is the state of knowledge on GCL transport parameters, diffusion coefficients? Great question. Um, really good question. An area that I like to work in, I don't have any of that content in here. And if you think that's something we ought to include in a future webinar, I'll be glad to include that. Uh, what you can do if you're doing, and some people do transport-based design, I've done that in my analysis. For example, we work in the rad waste area. We've got to do transport-based design in our analysis. We've got to not only predict the leakage rate, but the mass flux and the rate at which contaminants released from the facility. You can, what we do know about diffusion coefficients for GCLs is they tend to be lower than for compacted clays. Um, if due, due to a couple factors, the tortuosity, is smaller tortuosity coefficient. So essentially the, because the pore space is so irregular and small, the pathways through which molecules need to move are more tortuous and the diffusion coefficients lower. But another uh, it, equally important issue is, is um, essentially an osmotic hindrance. And Chuck Shackelford and, at Colorado State and Mike Malusis at, um, at Bucknell Universities have done a plethora of work on that. And I'll be glad to incorporate that in the, one of the future uh, webinars, if you think that's important. Be glad to do that. Um, what you can do though, if you're doing design and you wanna use a typical, you know, what I might use in design, I'd use a, a, a free solution diffusion coefficient. I'd use a tortuosity of about 0.2, so it's about 20% of the uh, free solution diffusion coefficient. That's really conservative. The actual diffusion coefficient for the bentonite's gonna be lower? Good question. Another question from Joan, also in the field, how do you guarantee that the GCL remains hydrated in the long term? Um, another, this is another great question. How do you know it's gonna remain hydrated? Uh, this is the beauty of depth and stress. Uh, we tend to put things in an environment that's moist, we cover it up, uh, and then we cover it with a great deal of overburden. And those conditions tend to promote hydration and promote uh, uh, steady water content in the bentonite. Although you can have environments where, for example, if you have a thermal gradient at the bottom of a containment facility, where you could drive out some of the moisture over time, you know, because moisture flows from hot to cold. Um, but at, at depth, uh, the experience has been largely that GCLs tend to remain hydrated uh, and essentially in perpetuity. Um, 
good questions. That could that would be a good PhD dissertation in itself. Uh, question from Daniel Landrum. Um, what is the proper process for preparing permeate to represent cation, cation concentrations coming from subgrade soils? Ah, this is a good question. So we get actually concentrations from the leachate, which tend to be the predominant issues, but we can also have issues from so-called subgrade uh, hydration processes and ion exchange from the subgrade itself. Um, there is, uh, we have a paper on this uh, that Joe Scali and I put together looking at subgrade uh, hydration effects and their, uh, and their impact on uh, hydraulic conductivity testing. Uh, you can run some shake type tests to look at, um, essentially you're taking the subgrade with um, uh, uh, a deionized water eluent and like a batch test shaking it, and then looking at the chemistry of that supernatant, that's one way to get at that chemical composition. Um, another process is you can take the subgrade soil, and this is one that I, I tend to prefer, and I will tend to permeate it with a moderate strength ionic uh, strength solutions. So some, and we have some recommendations on this in, I believe it's in ASTM D6766. And if I, if you email me later, I'll, I'll get you the appropriate information on that, uh, Daniel. But you can run a, essentially a, a column test and get the uh, eluent from that, analyze it, and that'll give you a, a good sense of the subgrade hydration cations as well. Usually I find those concentrations are dilute enough that they have very little impact, usually, not always. And we have a good paper, if you're interested, Daniel, that I could send you on the impacts, uh, cation exchange during subgrade hydration and impacts on hydraulic conductivity that Sabrina Bradshaw did a number of year, uh, years back. Alex, good to have you on board today. Alex Edstrom from Stantec. Alex and I do a lot of work together on the mining waste projects. Uh, are there concerns with long-term performance of GCLs for cover? Uh, and a good question. Certainly when we're dealing with cover systems, uh, if we don't have the GCL overlain with a gym membrane or being used in a laminated product, uh, we can have problems because it will impact um, the hydraulic conductivity. Now we've been fortunate, we've been monitoring field sites where we have some of the laminated products installed uh, in uh, Northern Minnesota. That's some work that Golder's doing with a mining company up there. And then out in, um, uh, in the phosphate patch in Southwestern, uh, Southeastern Idaho, excuse me, where we've had very good uh, performance from the GCL products um, uh, that have a laminate on top of them. Really good. So I, I hope I got at your question, Alex. Fortunately, Alex, you and I work together a lot. You can always ask me tomorrow when we have a conference call. Uh, another question from Chris Kelsey. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chris. Very uh, gracious for you to put that in the chat box. Uh, Carlos uh, Rodriguez, uh, in the solutions you suggest, including a gym membrane, would there still be necessary to include a GCL? This is a, a good question. You know, in our Conventional parlance and applications where we're typically building a composite barrier, whether we were using clay in a gym membrane, we need to use GCL in a gym membrane. But we all often, we need to always look at what is the right solution for the particular problem. There are applications where you can just do the gym membrane alone. Gym membranes last a very, very long time than today's products. And there are cover applications where a gym membrane is just fine. In fact, I've been uh, dealing with one myself where you know, we just compact the subgrade. It's impermeable enough as it is to put a 60 mil polyethylene texture product on top and away we go. Um, does confining stress, this is a question from Scott Creighton. Does confining stress caused by the waste material above the GCL affect the ability of the GCL to swell and the related hydraulic conductivity? This is a really good question because we look at often free swelling without confinement. Um, certainly you can imagine that the swelling of the bentonite could be constrained as the overburden stress goes up. 
But what's important is the swelling that occurs as the hydration process occurs. And whether that occurs, whether we've got load on top and it, the, we get a large swell volume or those bentonite particles themselves swell and fill the voids between them, that's gonna occur regardless of whatever the stress is. So high stress, low stress swelling mechanism will occur, whether they'll be manifested as a considerable change in volume at the macro scale of the bentonite will depend a lot on the stress, but what's important is that the chemical environment allow the granules to swell and fill the voids between them. Uh, in fact, a good example of this is uh, compacted bentonites used in high-level uh, rad waste containment where we pack bentonites around canisters, and we do know those are very high stress environments. Those, G those bentonites do tend to hydrate and swell. Um, from Thomas uh, Griddell, uh, you joined late. Did you cover gas permeability? I didn't cover gas permeability. If that's something people would like, let me know. I'll be glad to co uh, cover it or get somebody else to cover it. And uh, so there's a lot of good questions. I can imagine we have a whole series of these, get some other experts involved too to share. It's great. Uh, Ahmed Alcoa uh, is able to use any other clays instead of bentonite that gives higher performance. Not that I know of, you know, the, the bentonites are really primarily montmorillonites. The, it's the, the montmorillonites, the special sauce, you know, it's the active ingredient. And it, it is the ability of the bentonite to swell when it hydrates that makes everything happen. That's the magic is all around the swelling of the bentonite. And you only get that because bentonite is, is montmorillonite rich and that montmorillonite hydrates and swells. And now, Bentonite polymer products, could you begin to think of those type products with different clay minerals? Probably, if we haven't looked at that yet, that might be a good thing to be thinking about. Another question from Ahmed, uh, why GCL is rarely used in Egypt and Africa markets? I don't know. You know so much is about people being familiar with things and uh, comfortable with them as designers, and perhaps we just haven't um, had enough technology transfer in Africa and Egypt yet. Um, I have a great idea. Let's, when COVID is over and the world goes back to normal, let's have a GCL workshop in Egypt or some other part of, of Africa. I've, I've spent time in the Southern parts of Africa, fantastic uh, safari there a number of years back, uh, but I've never been to Northern Africa. I would love to come and talk. Um, another question from Ahmed, could GCL in direct contact with sun or UVA, uh, should it be protected uh, by another layer? You've got to protect GCLs. You you should not never have a GCL at the surface for an extended period of time. They have to be buried. You want to put a GCL, a gym membrane on top, and then it's got to be buried. Um, Herman, Herman Nig, um, will you include the difference in performance between sodium and activated sodium bentonite in your coming webinar? Um, I wasn't planning on that, but I will. That's a great topic. Um, sodium activated bentonites and conventional sodium bentonites can behave almost identically. It's really driven by how much residual divalent salts are remaining in the activated bentonites. Uh, the, the mineral itself um, uh, is uh, is similar, but I, I'll I'll build that in. We get to the chemical compatibility one uh, webinar three. I'll I'll build that in. Great idea. Uh, Tobin McKnight, uh, is there a reference for how to calculate RMD? Um, if you send me an email, Tobin, I'll send you an article on it. All right. It really easy to compute. All right. And uh, there is a, the equation is in the, in the webinar presented, which will be distributed. Uh, but it is a little bit, you know, I've got total molarity of monovalence and total molarity of divalence. It's not as, um, as explicit as it could be. Easy to program in an Excel spreadsheet though, and I have one of those. Um, and then there's Mylene asked the, the final question, how do you feel about, well, next to the final, how do you feel about the super groove system as an alternative to using the filet of bentonite? I, I know some, and I can't remember which manufacturer uses a super groove, but some manufacturers have a groove in the overlap that's intended to allow bentonite to move out of the needle punch to textiles and form that seal. Um, I haven't tested that explicitly. I, 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 my sense is it, it's so easy to put in the fillet of bentonite. I mean, it, 
It's inexpensive. It takes very little time. And my data indicate that it's, it tends to give us lower flow rates. You know, so from, and maybe that's the conservative engineer in me, but I would tend to use the filet of bentonite uh, if I was specifying products, regardless of whether they have an option to use it or not. That's just my opinion. I got to admit, it's not based on a lot of data. I haven't done that type of analysis, but it doesn't take much to, um, um, to add that. And I, I found it to be, it's one of those, those specifications that simple to put in and gives you a high degree of confidence. And from that perspective, I, I'm comfortable with it. And Roberto Ronson, um, why do we see specifications that require a confining stress to be placed over GCLs immediately after installing the GCL? Is this confining stress material really necessary? And this good question. It, it not necessarily confinement, but it is for protection. You know, we, once we get the GCL in and the geomembrane in, we want to get it covered. Um, that GCL, as soon as we place it on a subgrade, geomembrane on top of it or not, it begins to hydrate. It begins to draw moisture up from below. If we don't have it protected with a geomembrane and it, and it rains, we get moisture in from above. As the bent, the bentonite is is gritty, granular stuff when it's dry, but as soon as it gets wet and begins to hydrate, it's soft, mushy stuff. Any stress concentrations on the surface will tend to cause displacement of the bentonite in GCL, cause thin spots uh, in the GCL. That's just something we don't want to do. We want to get the GCL down. We want to get a gym membrane on top if it's not a laminated product, and then we want to get it covered as soon as practical. That's good practice. In fact, I, I, I have a case history. One of my students, Thomas Williams for, um, from SCS, reminded me that I owe him to get his paper finished, where well, we worked on a, a site where a GCL was not covered and it had sat exposed for a number of years, severely, severely damaged. Now that's, a, that's an extreme case. It had just a gym membrane on top, but no confining soil on top. And uh, it, it was, damage beyond uh, recognition. Uh, it was physically there, but its it, effectiveness as a barrier uh, was completely lost. So we want to, you know, we put a lot of energy to install these. We want to protect them to make sure that product we put in is uh, maintained. All right, that's the end of the questions. And I apologize, the first questioner, I deleted your question by accident. That's my um, uh, poor, uh, uh, chat box skills with GoToWebinar. I apologize for that. If I did delete yours and you remember it and want to send me a note on it, I will get back to you personally. I apologize for doing that. Okay, uh, we're at the end of our time as well. Um, I want to thank everybody. Um, I hope this was helpful. Again, I do have my email address uh, on the slides. Uh, we will make them available. We will make the CEUs available to you. Feel free to reach out to me if you have questions. In the end, our goal here is to share what we've been learning as an industry to bring all of our uh, knowledge up and so that we can do our jobs better, create, uh, select products more effectively, build better containment systems, build confidence in what we're doing as engineers and scientists and practitioners and scholars. So thanks a lot for today, and I hope you join for next time. We'll be having an announcement out on that for the quarter two webinar on bentonite polymer composite GCLs. Thank you.